This week's episode is brought to you by our good friends at Scratch. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. I am Francesca. This is a day in my life. Let's go have fun. First dad takes me for a walk. All the other dogs be jealous of my shiny coat. Then we go to the park. I always go get the ball when dad loses it. He's not very smart. Here you go dummy. Then we walk more. Walking is very good. Sleeping is good too. Do not disturb. Most days I sit up here. Every queen needs a throne. Then we wait for my scratch dog food to arrive. Because I am hungry AF. Here it is. BRB. Scratch dog food is delivered to my door on a personalized schedule just for me. Scratch is yum and it is good for my skin, digestion, energy and joints. Thank you dad. You aren't so dumb after all. And that is my day. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Min Jong, welcome to the Dylan Friends Podcast, my friend. It's an honor, it's a pleasure, it's a privilege to have you on this platform. And gee whiz, you are looking very nice today via this uh, platform. Thanks, mate. It's, it's good to be on. Uh, always happy to jump on podcasts here and there. Yeah, well, I, I am looking forward to doing this. I mentioned um, off screen, we've we've been uh, in talks about doing this one for a while. Um, I'd love to have had a few beers over and um, over the show and be able to do it in person. But obviously, uh, COVID at the moment has has thrown a spanner into the works. But you're freshly retired, mate. What's it feeling like at the moment? Um, I suppose you haven't really got to enjoy the illustrious career as yet because you've been locked inside for the last um, couple of months. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been really good, mate. Um, I, I thought I'd miss it a bit more than, than I did, but um, but I honestly don't miss it at all. Uh, miss seeing the boys uh, and, and all of that stuff, the camaraderie, but um, something, um, it's it's hard to explain the feeling. Um, it's definitely the uh, the cliche, the weight off the shoulders, but um, so, I don't know, something in me just, it, it just feels like I'm a completely different person and I'm a lot, a lot happier and more free, I guess. Oh, mate, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Look, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I retired because I, I definitely didn't. But I went through the same wave of emotions when um, my career finished, and I suppose it's something we'll touch on today. You've had some serious ups and you've had some some battles as well with fitness over over the years, and it'd be interesting to get your take on, on the insights to all of that. But no, I, I agree. Once you finally do um, retire or, or told it's the end, there's that uh, breath of fresh air just knowing that <laughs> You don't have to. You just don't have to do things that you used to do and dread so much. Yeah, especially when you're a tie before they can delist you, mate. That's, <laughs> that's where you went wrong, I reckon. <laughs> well, I always get into the boys, mate. I, I'm not just saying this, but yours definitely was a retirement. Okay, you're only you're, you're 28 years old. I don't know if you listen to some other things, but I got another podcast with Dan Gorringe, and we were debating um, this this fantasy at the moment of players that are retiring versus getting delisted and <laughs> yours is definitely retirement I'm you, you can't say that it wasn't you're a much further better player than I was more or less his career but at the moment in the AFL I'm I'm campaigning there's some serious issues in the AFL at the moment and and I'm leaving them to other people but one that I want to start advocating for is being on a board of commissioners approving retirees versus delistings <laughs> That's that's actually not a, not a bad idea. You got to go through certain, I guess, a certain checklist to to prove that you are truly retired and and put put that next to the. It's good to see it next to the brackets in my name, retired. Um, that's something I take a lot of pride in. I reckon <laughs> it's it's a big one. I, I think one of the precursors is if you're signing up playing local footy next year, um, you definitely didn't retire from footy. So are we seeing you? <laughs> In that, in saying that, though, I probably should have pre Are you going to be looking to have a run next year? Or are you going to actually just have a year off and chill out? Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll look to have a run. Um, I think the way things ended, I, I think my heart was still in it, um, but um, it was more so me listening to my body and and you know probably obviously the battles, uh, the ongoing battles that I probably knew I would have faced if I wanted to continue. Um, so definitely, uh, we'll look to play play on and. Um, I guess these days, yeah, it's um, with a lack of a resume, you probably need to play local footy to get a job these days. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, I, I, I know it, mate. It's a, it's a really tough time. And, and in, on a serious note, um, and something that we, you know, can even talk about now. Like I remember when uh, I finished my career at Carlton, firstly, and 
I suppose like just that weight off your shoulders for one, but there's also then it, that reality hits in just going like, what the fuck am I actually going to do? Like what, what is my life look like without footy? Because I think the hardest thing for me um, at that stage was like, you go to primary school, you go to high school, you go to an AFL club and for, you know, 20 years of your life, you've literally been on a schedule told to be here at this time. This is when you have your day off. This is when you go on holidays. This is when you bloody can stand up. This is when you sit down. And then it goes to a stage where you literally control your calendar and you've got to book things in and have that autonomy to actually like run your own life. Yeah, it is like, it's just such a, you just sort of become so institutionalized and, and you're right. Things are, things are just done for you. Um, even, even us emailing back and forth, like I, I forgot, to, I forget to check my emails and that's a thing I've got to start doing and, and, and <laughs> little things like that. And, and adding in uh, Zoom calendar invites and, and things like that that you got to do on your own, which um, usually like that. But at the Bulldogs, we, we get a full list of calendar invites and this is what you do at this time, this is what happens at this time. So it is it is sort of equally scary, but um, but nice to have some sort of, some form of independence again. It's exciting and I'm, I'm actually really excited for you because I know how uh, fulfilling it can be really, you know, starting to work those things out on your own um not to say that i've worked them out myself to be honest it's 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 a continual grind but it um no it is really rewarding is there any idea of what is is next at this stage Are you just having some time off to enjoy at the moment as we said we are in lockdown there isn't much you can do but are you just going to sort of chill out and and see out the year and then um fall into something uh yeah obviously sort of i guess you know in a perfect world i would have loved to to be able to travel um once i finished up but um, I guess for now, I, I told myself I, I'd let myself sort of have a couple of months just to just to relax and and sort of regenerate and recuperate until I started really thinking about what lies next for me. Um, I think in a broad sense, um, I'd love to love to get into some field of work that just involves uh, helping other people. Um, I think along along my journey in footy, um, that's something I found that was sort of really rewarding and fulfilling. Um, and so something in the mental health field or, or social work and um, would be ideal, but also not naive enough to, to think I can just walk into any sort of job like that. So um, still still a bit of an open book at the moment, but uh, in a perfect world, that's what um, what would be next for me. It's exciting, mate. No, I don't doubt that for a minute. I'm sure we'll get an incredible insight in today into in how much you, know, you could um, – you could pass on, I suppose, to other people going through certain situations. But, um, hey, let's go back to the start. I, I want to know a little bit more about yourself and, and your upbringing and how you got to where you are now. Um, I know you're extremely passionate about multiculturalism. Um, am I right to say East Timor is your heritage? Is that correct? Yeah, Dad's from East Timor and then uh, Mum's from Taiwan. So a bit of a, uh, bit of a random mix. That, uh, that's not that common, but that's, that's the one. What uh, was it like growing up, I suppose, in Australia at that stage? And, and if you're happy to go into it, I think your father's got a pretty incredible story of how, you know, your family actually migrated to Australia in the first place. Um, yeah, I guess, well, I guess I'll start with dad. Um, so uh, East Timor, is a, it's, a, it's a third world country. It's, you know, um, um, I, I was lucky enough to go there and sort of see firsthand what it was like and pretty eye-opening to, to think dad sort of grew up there um, and and how he came about and where he is now. Um, and um, when he was 18, he uh, ended up leaving East Timor to study um, and just so happened to be that uh, Indonesia invaded East Timor um, uh, about three months after he left and so he, um, he wasn't really able to come back and, um, you know, had a, had a couple of relatives pass away during the war and and traveled around pretty much, um, just doing work um, here and there and studying and, and managed to meet mum um, at some party, not too, uh, nothing too romantic, um, <laughs> where they um, had uh, my first sister in Taiwan and then eventually moved to Australia to um, in about 1986, I'd say, um, to, I guess, start fresh. I suppose to, to follow on, like growing up in Australia at that stage with parents coming from another country how was that for you and you know then following that that like going into football um yeah I guess for me it was um I always sort of saw myself as just you know 
Australian born, just a normal normal kid. Uh, my sisters found it pretty difficult, um, obviously coming to to Australia, not having spoken a word of English. Um, and um, yeah, I guess growing up was pretty pretty normal for me. I, I didn't think of it as any sort of different being sort of multicultural and, and I guess where I grew up was really a multicultural area. Um, and it probably wasn't until I started um, playing footy that um, I started to have that sort of inner monologue where it's like, geez, I am actually quite different and, and, and um, yeah, just a bit of a sort of a fresh face to this game, I guess. Did it change over your period of time? Like, how have you seen that evolve um, since you started the AFL to when you left it? Because I know you did a bit of work with the AFL in, in multiculturalism, especially playing with the doggies. Um, we know how passionate they are about growing the game in the West. Like, have you been pretty moved on how far it's come since you started? Um, I have. I, I think originally when I first started playing footy, I was, I was super self-conscious about it, um, being a being an Asian kid and, and playing footy. Um it's a tough one to explain, um, but just that that thought, maybe it was in my own head, but that just, I'm so different to everyone here. And and uh, it sounds a bit funny, but almost, um, you know, I thought people would sort of find it funny that I played footy, um, which was, you know, years back. Um, and then going into the AFL, being rookie, um, rookie listed um, and, that my background sort of being made a big deal of, um, which I can understand, but all I wanted to do was just, you know, be like any other player and, and, and not have any spotlight on me regarding that. Um, um, and then I guess, yeah, going along the way, it, I found, um, and just, you know, in life in general, when you grow up, you, you just embrace your identity and, and you don't need to be, yeah, I guess um, ashamed of it or, or, um, or, n- or knowing I'm different in, in the whole AFL industry um, was something I thought, like now I think it's just, I should be really proud of. You know, it's a, it wasn't an easy sort of thing to go through. Um, I guess, especially in juniors, having, you know, kids being kids and, and saying things here and there. Um, and, and then now I look back and, and to be the person of, you know, I guess my first background um, to play AFL um, albeit a pretty unique background, um, is is something I just, yeah, I love and embrace now. It's pretty unbelievable, man. Like, I, I, I'm i not lying, like, I, I do get even goosebumps thinking about that because I can imagine it wouldn't have been easy at stages, um, as you said, in, in juniors and, and times like that. And I, I completely understand as well um, what you're saying about not wanting it to be the focal point of why, like, you're young, coming into a club and, and this isn't, you know, you don't want to be known as... Um, just a multicultural player, you just want to be treated like everyone else. As time goes on, you mature, you pick up, and then you actually start to embrace how proud you are of the actual fact. Yeah, and I think especially growing up and and, and as a kid, uh, I think you know being um, having your role models is is being able to see yourself in that person. Um, and I don't think I ever had that regarding football. You know, I understand there was Asian players before me, but um, I guess with the how I, how I look, how, what my name is, it's it's quite it's quite out there, and 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 then to to think now that I hope or you know I was able to or you know make kids feel more comfortable if they were Asian playing footy because they can think well Lin Jong plays football so that makes it easier for me to start playing football sort of thing. Right, you've no doubt you've you've done that. It's exactly what you said. It's then for young Asian kids to be able to be like oh my god, there's fucking Lin Jong like I can do this too. And I think we can get annoyed sometimes um, at, at seeing these things and think, what well, like, this is so obvious. Of course, this can happen. But you're right. It's for the kids to actually see themselves in that. And that's something, I suppose, as me growing up, I, I never actually had to really face those that fears. It was just already mm. there. So you, you really do take it for granted. Yeah, yeah. And I guess to, to even think the thought that I was, not that I think I was the first one or, or anything along those lines, but to be to be that one that they can see themselves in um, and then, you know, hopefully down the line it just keeps happening and happening. But to, I guess, think of it as, as almost being a pioneer of it is, um, yeah, now, now that I'm actually doing some reflection now, which is, you know, something I probably haven't thought about and now, but now we're speaking about it is something that's it's actually quite a big deal to me now, you know? Yeah, 
It's huge, mate. You should be extremely proud. Very, very good. We'd be cheersing a beer right now, maybe a couple of shots, and Booker, uh, bloke in the bars and, and whatnot, and we'll reflect on it more. But let's go back then, mate. Uh, rookie draft in 2012, um, pick nine. We actually just realised then we are both in the same draft. I didn't actually know that um, at all. Now, this isn't going to be the most hard-hitting question you've copped today, but something I'm always fascinated, fascinated about is numbers. And you ran with, like, you got given the 46. Like, when I was a rookie of the Giants, you get given, you know, the numbers that aren't the most desirable. <laughs> but in a way, you make it your own. And you embrace that number. And I feel like the 46 now at the Doggies is, it's Lin Jong's number. Was there ever a chance for you, or did you ever get offered to actually change that? And you said, nah, fuck this, this is me? I did, actually. Um, I'm always so fascinated in these stories. <laughs> <laughs> it probably was a bit of uh, So it was in, what was it, twenty uh, end of 2014, start of 2015, when, when we had our coach, Brendan McCartney, leave. We had Ryan Griffin, our captain, leave. Um, and there was, there, was a, there was a lot of moving pieces. Um, and the uh, GM of footy um, called me up and um, he said, you know, obviously – there's been a few things happening and um, I, I seem to have been an up and coming player and they thought they'd offer me number 16, Ryan Griffin's old number, old captain's number. Um, and I, I, for me, I, I, I love the, uh, I love the forties. Um, we, uh, at, at the Bulldogs, we'd call it the Bronx and then we had, <laughs> and then we had, uh, what was it about say, say 20, 18 to, to the 30s, that was, that was your middle class. And then we had Turak in the, uh, the old 1 to 12. Um, and the way the, the locker room was set up, um, you know, obviously in the 40s, the blokes are coming and going. There's no one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and it, it actually so happened to be that that was my number at Oakley Chargers. So they obviously didn't rate me there either. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and it's my date of birth, coincidentally. So so my parents love the number. I, I love the number and, and and what it I guess what what the higher number was represent in the AFL. Um, and and I didn't want to pick I didn't want to fill in the number of the ex captain. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. It's sticking fat. I, if, like I totally agree. And and being a rookie um, you know, albeit the lesser was later in my career, you sort of have that chip on your shoulder and you actually start to embrace being a higher pick. You've got your crew that you sit with, you know, we've done it the, tar- the hard way. And, um, and it's so true. Like the club, you all have those. We used to call one to 10, like Hollywood Boulevard. Um, <laughs> and you had, yeah, like Ligon Street. And I can't even remember if the other one even got a good name, but no, you you're right. It, it's called a it Greater West Sydney, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally. Um, that's huge. So your career, mate, let's delve into that then. So after 2014, things start to really take off with you. And I suppose you're, you're a pretty funny character now. You, and I'll have to draw a lot of these um, answers out of you. But you were really a dominant player, mate. Like you, I think you internally would have been rated for how hard you were. But I think externally, um, you might not have got the the accolade you deserved in terms of your toughness. Like it, it was, so it was that the key pillar to your game is just you're putting your body on the line. It's yeah. It's something, I guess, you know, if you're that kind of player, you don't really have to, if you're second guessing yourself or well, you're not that kind of player sort of thing, you know? And so that was sort of a big thing for me when I first started, that was my, um, my niche, I guess. Um, and it got to a point where um, they had to tell me to just ease up on, on, flying back with, with the back and you know if, you, if you're not going to get there you don't have to get there <laughs> um but it wasn't it wasn't to try to be a hero or anything it was it was just sort of innate in me and um um and obviously kind of coming off second best here and there um and then I think yeah somewhere somewhere along the line that started to teeter off a little bit um just with the old body but um but when I first sort of started I think that's what um yeah, that that was sort of my thing, just sort of the the toughness and 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 just putting my body on the line, and and I hope you know that's what that's what my teammates thought of me. Well, there's a pretty evident story that's quite well known to to Western Bulldog supporters, and and we all know the 2016 year and what transpired with with the the premiership there. But that year in that campaign was you know you're in some incredible form, um, and I think you know what I'm alluding to here. But that you know the story of you. Injuring yourself, I think, in one of the, the first finals over there at um, against West Coast, 
um, breaking the collarbone, going and playing in the VFL Premiership, coming back and, and nearly getting there for the AFL Grand Final. Um, would you be happy to talk us through that story? Like what, what, how it all played out at that time, the ins and outs and, and maybe the things that we might not have even known about coming from, I suppose, even that year, how you are feeling and, and what you were going through at that time? I guess so. That year is probably, you know, my best year of footy and then sort of things went a bit downhill there. But as a fringe player, I finally felt comfortable and set in the team, um, not having that angst every week, am I in, am I out? Um, and then in the final, um, yeah, just weird to think back on, but was was a starting midfielder in that team um, and and broke my collarbone in the uh, in the second quarter and um, was 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 really shattered, quite shattered, obviously. Um, not sure if anyone's seen, but tear, tear, like crying on the bench, thought that was my last game, um, possibly for the Bulldogs in general. Um, and then we uh, they say, you'll be back in a couple of weeks and... and at that point, I'm just like, no, it like it's a broken collarbone. But get the red eye home, um, arrive at a 6 a.m., um, booked in for an operation at 4 p.m. the next day, put the plate in, um, and it was sort of just, we'll see how we go from there. And then um, um, missed the next game, um, which we played against Hawthorne in the, um, in the final. Um, and then... Uh, we had GWS in the prelim the next week, which um, which uh, I had to do a fitness test for, and it was the worst fitness test I've ever done in my life. I had Joel Corey there, pretty much just punching me in the collarbone, um, just because I needed that to make sure I could I could get up and, and mentally I knew I was ready. And then um, if we if we actually lost in the final, I wouldn't have played in the VFL Grand Final. Um, but then obviously the boys ended up winning, so. Um, I actually had a slab of beer with my mates watching in case we lost, and then obviously had the uh, the old spag bowl next to me as well. Um, and the boys got up in a great win, and so I was sort of like, "Yep, ready to play in the VFL Grand Final." Um, get to the game, um, and the physio comes up to me, and they're like, "Oh, um, the medical the me- medical team want to uh, want to strap up your other shoulder," and I was like, "No, like I don't want to do that. If I do that," It's as if I'm injured and I'm coming in this game saying I'm not injured. And they said, no, no, we really think you should do it. I'm like, no, don't want to do it. And then eventually they sort of said, we'll do a minimal taping. If you don't like it, um, just rip it off. It doesn't even matter. Um, And so I'm like, yep, all right, sounds good. So first sort of first bounce walk out there and Casey just (laughs) straight into me. I didn't probably – I probably wasn't too ready for that. I didn't think they – they would have uh, wanted to go after me like that, um, but they just kept on going after the one with the uh, with the strapping on it, um, which was the wrong shoulder at this stage, isn't it? This which is was the wrong shoulder, yes, yeah. yes. And just going up, like just I'd kick it, and then four seconds later they come up and just bump me, and 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 um, I was, some, someone did tell me from the from the Casey team that they was they were told to go after me, um, which is fair enough, um, and then. Um, yeah, happened to play a, a decent game, and and my shoulder was absolutely fucked. My my good shoulder, <laughs> the one that that my you know, non broken collarbone side was absolutely fucked. I couldn't couldn't lift it for for three or four days because they just went after it so much. And then uh, we had to rescan the collarbone, and it was bent to shit. So, um, so <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much it. So just to recap that story, which is unbelievable, you've. Played in a elimination final, I think it was over in WA. Break your collarbone, fly back, get the surgery done. Two two weeks later or three weeks later, you're back playing. Uh, two weeks. I like to. It sounds more impressive. I missed one game, so I think that's okay. It. That's <laughs> very <laughs> impressive. That's you missed one. Anyway. You missed one game. <laughs> you come back, play in the VFL Grand Final. You don't just play well. You actually get best on ground, and the one of the best tricks of all time that we've seen is the medical staff actually uh, strapping the wrong shoulder for that game, which end, inevitably end up actually fucking your other shoulder. But to this day, like, that's actually got to be one of the biggest flexes of physio staffs of all time. Like, I just still underrate that so highly. Yeah, I think someone pointed – I think a journo might have pointed out, actually, because there was a picture of me with my collar – with the sling on my right side and then 
my left side strapped. And um, yeah, no, I think that's sort of when it caught along. It's on Twitter, and then people started realizing. And and um, and I, I honestly don't know if I would have lasted the game if I didn't do that because that would have just like my, my the plate bent as a, like <laughs> like without them going after that shoulder. So I I, I honestly don't think I would have made it through. What was the conversation like after that? So for people that don't know, the VFL Grand Final was played the week before the AFL Grand Final. You're in incredible form that year, as you said. You're starting midfielder. You're an integral part of the team. You go out, you come back in and win best on ground in the VFL Grand Final. As a, as a romantic, um, you know, AFL lover, I was just crossing my fingers for, for the love of the game that you would be coming back in for the Grand Final. Was, it, was there ever a chance of that happening or, or was it too far gone at that stage I suppose after that win against the Giants what you alluded to earlier was you know it's widely known as one of the best wins of, of all time um yeah so after the uh the granny and then sort of being best on after after sort of soaking up the victory um we were actually told we weren't allowed to drink none of the uh, AFL listed players were allowed to drink after the granny um in prep for next week um and sort of in my head I was I, I, I thought I'm a good chance um you know best on ground um um, we'll see how the week goes throughout. I hadn't spoken to Bevo too much. Um, there was a lot of congratulatory sort of messages. Got to training, um, going back to the shoulder, I couldn't, still could not lift it till the, till the Wednesday that week. So I sort of ruled myself out and even in that. But then sort of um, got through the main training session and it was, so, it was one of those, um, you know, hope for the best, expect the worst kind of things. You know, a prelim side's just one and then, and the boys, you know, boys all played really well, and um, and I think matchup wise, we um, they had a fair few tools as well, um, and so got the uh, got the old tap on the shoulder, and, and and spoke to Bevo in the hallway, and he said, "Look, mate, um, you know, we really appreciate your efforts, but um, we're we're not going to go with you this week. Um, you." your first emergency if anything happens but sort of just wanted to let you know and at that time it was it was it was really shattering and it probably took me a long time to process it all and and sort of not harbor that resentment um about it and and sort of just be be grateful i was a vfl premiership player because um yeah i guess putting things in perspective that's a bloody bloody big deal I know externally how much impact that you would have actually had on the team at that stage. Like to see one of the most dominant players in, in 2016 go out, come back, put themselves on the line, react the way you did, go back and play VFL. Like was that internally appreciated as much as you'd think it would be? Like I think you'd probably underestimate how much you would have impacted the team's mentality and that drive to actually keep still winning that 2016. Like, I know you didn't get the medal in the end, but how much you were still a part of that, your teammates would have appreciated and seen, like, fuck me, this bloke's just done this. Like, how much is that a driving force? I guess we don't like to put guys in the limelight and whatnot, but um, um, I, was with, I was with a uh, function with Bevo, and he sort of mentioned um, how sort of big of a deal it was in terms of, it. I guess, an inspiring thing for the boys. Like, I guess to go through that and, and that's how fucking bad I wanted to come back and play. Um, Cause as I said before, if, if the boys didn't win the um, prelim, I, I, I didn't want to put sort of sacrifice my body for that. I, I would hope that it was something, you know, as the momentum kept going, that was just like a really big thing for the boys to, to sort of be a part of and, 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 you know, draw inspiration from and, and, um, yeah, I guess it was one of those ones where where it wasn't totally spoken about, but I, I, I hope anyway that it was, you know, they could sort of just see just by how much I was sort of willing to do to, to just be there um, and just, you know, for them to to be pretty proud of where, where they are now, I guess. Yeah, I have no doubt it played a massive role in, in that 2016 tilt for the flag. You, you said earlier when you injured it straight away, you said that not only was it, you were doubting that you'd get up for the season, but you said it actually might be the last game for the Bulldogs. Is that alluding to then contract talks that were going on at that time that you might be leaving? Was that something that was going through your head or am I reading into that? No, that was that was definitely it. Um, contract talks were still um, sort of a bit on hold or they were sort of lowballing me a little bit. Um, and, and, um, and I still hadn't made my mind up till about um, maybe a month after the grand final, I think it was. Um, 
and sort of tossing up whether this money was worth it or, or do I want to stay at the dogs and um, being, a, being, as we said before, a fringe player, um, those kind of contracts don't come around too often. It's usually the, the two years and, and that's about it. And if um, you're lucky. If you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so there were, there were a whole lot better offers out there, but um, I guess um, at the sort of my final decision was, am I unhappy at the Bulldogs? And do I really think I can, do I back myself to, to get in this 22? And, and I did. And I, I love the culture. I love the place there. Um, I think speaking to other guys, people, uh, you know, someone made mention of footy clubs are footy clubs and, you know, the boys in locker room, the boys in locker room. But, but for me, it wasn't quite like that. Um, you know, I made a lot of friendships and, and a lot of that meant more to me than, than the money being offered, I guess. No, I, I totally agree with that, mate. I, I've spent time at two clubs and I think it's not the clubs in general, like it's not attacking the clubs, but it's the people that are there at that time that you are. You can definitely have different connections to what you can somewhere else. And I think, yeah, you don't know what you got till it's gone sometimes, like yeah, in, in your yeah. case. And then I probably, in mine, I've been pretty uh, honest in the fact that like when I left Carlton and went to the Giants, it was like a bit of like, wow, is this actually what footy clubs are meant to be like? You know, yeah. like it was a bit of a wake up. So, um, yeah, it's pretty crazy in in that aspect. Um, after 2016, I suppose, you signed on with the Dogs, um, you know, playing some good footy, but I suppose that's where some of these injuries start popping up. Um, I don't know how many, you know, you've been, you've had your ACL, you've had your hamstring, and there's probably 14,000 other ones that we don't even know about. Um, what was that time for you in terms of injuries? And, and I hate when we talk, uh, when I talk to like, you know, players or ex-players about injuries, sometimes you can be known as, in, you can be known as the injury and that, that just becomes you and yeah. it's all enticing. And I, what, what was it like for you at that stage? I think that actually helps my case sometimes because people think I could have been a whole lot of better player than I could have. Hundred <laughs> <laughs> so, percent. I could have been anything if I didn't do my calf fight like oh, six exactly. times. Like, I, I was I was oh, not going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess um, it, it probably started in 2015. I had to I had to get a groin reconstruction. Actually, as bad as that sounds, and I guess that stint in rehab was my first big hit. And I said, oh, like that was fucking tough. Like. I don't know how people do that. And then 2016 went along well, obviously the collarbone. And 2017 was having my best career, uh, uh, sort of, uh, sorry, season career-wise. Um, and then happened to do my ACL. And and I guess if we're going down the list, um, you know, did the ACL. And then um, while I was recovering from my ACL, we found out I had to get a wrist reconstruction during that as well. So that whole sort of, Patch was just a, it was a, like a nightmare to be honest. Um, and then, and then coming back into the 2018 sort of preseason, um, I was I was a bit bit one of those players that was the uh, I used to star in the preseasons, and then round one comes around, and <laughs> things start to happen, <laughs> um, which might be why I was rated so highly internally. Um, but and then 2018 happened, um, and I did a really bad hamstring injury, so I missed the start of the season. And um, and then broke my collarbone again that year, and then 2019 preseason came up, having a once again a great preseason, <laughs> and then I did a really bad hamstring injury again um, at the start, oh, right, sort of right before the start of the season, and at that point, um, all that I think I think all those injuries and all the sort of the toll it took on me mentally um, got me to a point where, where I needed to take time off playing and that was professional advice I was getting um, because I put that off for, for a fair while, to be honest. And, and then after 2019, we go to 2020, another hamstring injury before the season starts. But then I thought my luck was turning around with, uh, with a lockdown because um, I actually got to recover for about eight weeks without ever missing a game. And then managed to come back into the AFL team and then did my ankle and was out for the season and then and then this year did my hamstring was out for the season and that's I think that was that was, that was the uh, the final straw I think for me far out yeah I didn't know the extent to uh, how many injuries have been back to back but how do you cope with that and and or how do you not cope with that I suppose in a way like there's incredible resilience that's being built and I speaking from experience I haven't been through anything that you've been through but you do get 
you know, you go through adversity and you get stronger, but there is an underlying toll that when you're in football, and I think it's hard for people to understand, and, and yes, it's just injuries and you can think about what you're grateful for and all these other things, but at the end of the day, it's your job. It's all-encompassing. It's what you're like 100% passionate about and it's not in your control. So you can be doing everything you possibly can. You can be working everything you possibly want and putting all your mind and energy into this, but there's some things that are just completely out of your control and that's probably the most heartbreaking fact of, of injuries in football, I'd, I'd say from my point of view anyway. Yeah, it was it, sort of along the journey. I took different approaches to it. Um, I guess, you know, when I was younger, to, so to speak, um, it was – I was so motivated, um, did my ACL, um, you know, I'm just like, I'm coming back from this, like I'll be coming back bigger and stronger. And then sort of the next injury happens and it's like, yep, I can come back from this. I did my ACL, I can come back from that. Um, one more thing happens and it's like, so it slowly, slowly starts to wear, wear, wear down on you and, and I guess I liken it to, you know, every injury is sort of, um, you know, your heart breaks a little bit um, in that sense. And, and for me, it got to a point where it was just sort of shattered into pieces and, and, and a lot of it was why me. And and not that football, let's say, gave me depression, but um, there was a big part of it that things were happening in football that I couldn't control. And, and I was questioning a lot of things as to why is this happening to me? You know, what have I done to deserve this? And, and all those sort of thoughts, that, um, you know, as players you think about, and and I think the uh, the the light bulb moment for me this year when I when I tore my hamstring um, is sitting down with the physios and going through what your time frame looks like and you know week two we're going to be doing this week four and there was something in me that just didn't want to do it at all in the slightest bit um, the uh, that that fire to come back and and that um, that inner voice saying why. Well, I've come back from worse injury, so I can come back from this. That just was not there anymore, and and I think once that was gone, um, I knew I, I knew it was time. You, you alluded to your mental health before, and 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 said that there was a time when you took, you know, you had advice to take time away from the game. What did it get to you for that? Like, what was your experience? As much as these were physical injuries, it sounds like they were having a lot more of a mental impact um, than they were physical. Yeah, it was. Um, it sort of started becoming a lot worse in, in 2018, 2019. Um, um, like to a point at 2018, um, um, I was seeing a, a psychologist and a psychiatrist and, and they're saying, y- y- you need to stop playing footy. Like if you want to get better, um, you know, you've got to put that aside and, and focus on your mental health. And, and at that point, I was probably still a bit naive um, in ter- and probably a bit still uneducated in terms of mental health. And I'm like, no, like I-, I have to play. It's my job. You know, that's what I get paid to do. That's what my teammates expect of me. Um, um, and, and, and I was out of contract at that point. So it's like, well, I'm not going to come out and say this um, um, because they're just not going to offer me a contract. You know, they're going to, which is, you know, a really bad stigma with mental health, but that's, that's, that's what my, my uh, thinking was. And then in um, in 2019, um, I guess you know after getting injured again and then having to come back through the VFL, um, I it got to a point where um, you know as a general sense, as footy players or, or any sports players, you you play you play a good game, you're happy with yourself. You play a bad game, you're not happy with yourself, and that's just how how it sort of worked. And then it got to a point where I was you know actually playing quite well and and. I'd get in the car and I was with my ex-partner and I said, something's really wrong. Like I'm, I feel like fucking miserable. Like I, I've, I've just been sort of best on ground in that game. And, and I don't know, I, I, I don't know what, what this feeling is. And, and, and it was fucking scary at that time. But, but then that's when I sort of took it more seriously, um, which, you know, looking back, there could have been a lot of things done better, but that was, that's what, how I dealt with it. And, and then at that point, um, I said, I, I, I really do think I need to stop playing and, and, and listen to the people who, who know what they're talking about. I, I suppose it, getting to that tipping point and a stage where you're actually going through that, like what did you do to get yourself back to a good frame of mind and, and be, I suppose, more holistic with your mental health? Like what did you have to learn? 
what were the things you put in place, what worked best for you, and and what did you need? Was it, is, is it a good support network around you? Is it having people that you trust in, or is it just being that final like voice of when you say like, hey guys, like, like fuck, I am actually struggling, and you realise that people actually just want you to be be better. That makes you more acceptable to go and seek help. It, it, it is actually a whole mixture of, of what you just mentioned. Um, I guess originally was was the um, was it was a diagnosis, I suppose, where it's where it's like you you do have depression, and 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 that you know hit me really hard. Like that was sort of like what's what's my life come to and then and and then that sort of hopelessness of of this is how i'm going to feel forever um and then um i guess you know that acceptance stage was was a really tough thing for me um and and being footy but in in the afl world you know what you're you're expected to go out in public and for everyone to know that you have this about you which you might not like it but that's just sort of you know how, how it is and then the, the quicker I was able to accept it and say, you know, this is who I am. Um, when I when I was able to tell the boys, this is how I'm going. Um, you know, just being embraced with walking up, walking arms, and and saying, we've got your back. You know, you, you've got nothing to worry about. Um, um, and and so that was sort of a big part in coming back, and even my sort of my change of perspective on things, and and a lot of it, I think. Growing up through footy um, was I likened my footy, my football ball, balling ability and how I played to, to my worth as a person, um, which is crazy to think of now because it just doesn't make any sense. But when you're so invo- heavily invested in football, that's what you sort of think of yourself. And, and I guess that's what the general public, you know, how, how you're valued in, in society. Um, but... But it took a lot of, you know, talking with, with the right people and, and finding the right balance and, and, and you know, trying, trying different medications, for example. Um, and um, so, yeah, I finally, finally managed to find the right, um, the right balance in my life and in, 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 you know, what I was doing and, and how I was thinking especially. Um, and then once it got to that point where I could say, you know what, I'm ready to play footy and, and – it actually was bizarre because the less I cared about footy and it was the better, the better my performance was funnily enough. Um, and so, yeah, once I came back, it was just all about having fun again, um, not caring about my performance and, and it sounds a bit corny, but, um, finding happiness in other people's successes, you know, um, you're so, as I guess, AFL players, you're, you're quite selfish people in that sense. And then so once I could sort of just be happy and, and for, for my friends and my teammates and not be jealous or, or, or think, you know, why am I getting this? Um, that was a big turning point for me. That was a music to my ears, what you just said then, because uh, we, I had a chat with um, Brandon Jack a few weeks ago and it was actually the first time that I'd voiced that publicly as well that exactly what you mentioned there um, with, with football and being able to, you know, finally when I realised that I wasn't going to be playing the next year, was the fact that I was like, fuck, I'm not competing with these guys anymore. Like, you know, my the people that I've got these spots with, I don't have to wish bad things on them. I don't have to mm. wish they get injured. I don't have to wish they play a shit game. And it I is, know it's like- It's a bit of an unspoken even, thing, that. It, it? it is. It's just like in your head, like you, you say it out loud now and you're like, fuck, I actually didn't want these things to happen. But that's just the survival mode that you go to is the things that you actually like think. You're just like, fuck, you know, I need this bloke to- to miss a game so that I can get the opportunity um, mm. to go in. And, and it does make you feel like a shit person. Like you were saying before, separating that person versus the persona of, of, of anything in sport or in life. Like you've got a persona of who you are being, you know, on the field and a competitor, a player, but then you've got the person too. So it's being able to like split the difference of, of who you are versus what you do. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and even that using, using an example of the 2016 grand final, um, um, of which I feel like I can openly talk a bit more about now that I don't play. Um, anyone who's missed a grand final, you're watching and you're like, I hope this, I hope we lose, honestly. Um, that, that really sort of selfish, toxic voice in you, um, wishing the worst for, for your friends. Um, but selfishly, it's like, well, I hope they lose so I don't miss out on anything um, instead of I hope we win because 
I love I love Tom Libertori and he's my friend and this would be so great for him. You know what I mean? Just that mm. little that little change in a voice and, and perspective on things um, makes a world of a difference. It is, isn't it? And even like you saying that then, like I can completely relate to that in so many facets, but there's I know there's there's two parts of your brain, isn't there? That's like your brain versus your mind. And I think like your brain obviously wants you know, there's probably actually an actual terminology for this that a psychologist could talk about a lot better than I can. <laughs> yeah. But there's something like there's in your brain. You obviously want your team to win. You want your your friends to go well. But then there's that little person on your shoulder being like, "No, nah, fuck this. I'm not a part of it. Like this is this is bullshit. Why always me?" And and I'll admit, like, there's even times now where like I get to that um, in life. But I think as you go on and as you mature, you just you can catch yourself out earlier on it. Um, it's not, you know, when you're young, I feel like you just get so caught up in it and you don't actually know how to break out of it. Yeah, you assume that's a norm and, 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 and there's no other sort of, there's no other gra- the sort of grass is greener on the other side type thing. You mentioned, bef- um, you know, earlier in the show about what you want to do post football and helping people and being able to, you know, learn from your experiences. What do you, do you find with your mental health holistically was the best thing, the best thing for you that you could do to, to get on top of um, everything and, and, and feel better about your whole, you know, just your self worth. I I do remember a big a big moment for me when, when I was completely lost, um, you know, while I was play, while while I wasn't playing, sorry, and, and trying to figure out how to, how am I supposed to get better. Um, I, I find you know talking to my mates um, and checking in and, and and all those kinds of things that uh, work well for me, um, but um, it sounds a bit sort of simple and. and uh, but this was sort of for my personal experience. Some, someone who had been going through a really tough time, because um, you do take comfort in in listening to people who have been through what you're going through, or or things like that. And 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 for someone to tell me, just please stick at it. Um, it might not seem like things are working, but it does get better eventually. Um, to hear that was sort of just this crazy moment for me it's my simplest words but to hear it from someone who's who's gone through it um and to just you know because you get the advice to do this and say well i'm a footy player i exercise every day you know that's and you know i talk about exercise oh well i talk to my friends every day i um i'm seeing a psychologist i'm on medication nothing's fucking changing like what what else can i do like this is or am i just stuck like this and then yeah, for someone to say that to me sort of gave me that motivation as well. To keep on, keep on persisting at, at what I was doing, and 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 there wasn't a moment where it's like, yeah, I'm better now. It's just something that just, I don't know. It's just like, well, this is just how I am now, and and I know when I feel shit, and I know when I feel good, and and I can say I feel good, you know. Mate, it's it's pretty incredible that you can you can even say that now. Like I I know, um, yeah, I really have a really blessed to have a platform like this so I can get people on like yourself to share your stories and you know for for so long I actually forget sometimes that people actually listen to these chats and and to know that there'd be so many people out there that have have been through um or not been through but a feeling what you felt at some stage and then to have Lin Jong come out and say that you know he's been through it and he knows that you can't understand, but if you just stick fat and you're with it then you can get through it like you're then now passing those messages on to, to other people. Yeah, and it was like it's just it's such a simple thing, but um, I think maybe sometimes it gets lost along the way um, when you're when you you know trying to get through these tough times for someone to just say um, just hang in there, you know. It, for me, anyway, that was such a big turning point for me, and that's um, you know I can recall the whole thing that happened, and that's how big of an impact it had on my life and. And it really is one of the things. If he didn't say that, I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. Don't know where I'd be. And and not trying to press it in, into something here that you, you don't want to talk about. Was this conversation with a, a teammate or a friend, or was it just with someone that didn't know that was going on with you at that stage? Um, it was actually with the uh, the club doctor um, who was willing to open himself up and say, you know, I've you know I've been through what you're going through and. And, and as we're talking about now that, you know, me opening up myself, I hope that, you know, I, I do that in the hope that it, it just helps anyone out there, you know? It's unbelievable, mate. No, you fucking credit to yourself. I honestly, yeah, it's, 
it is that, and you're going to be inspiring a lot of people from this. So I'm bloody excited for people to hear it. Um, there's a lot more to the Ling John that we know, just besides the uh, incredible football career, the injuries, and and um, and everything else. One thing that I wanted to talk about today, coming into this, because I've never met someone that actually loves this, and I have a bit of a, clo- a closet um, love for this. Is is Pokemon? Now I know that you're <laughs> a big Pokemon boy. Is this facts? I do love Pokemon. I was a big, big fanboy. Um, obviously, not as much anymore, but um, yeah, big. Big fan of Pokemon. Did you collect cards? I did, and and <laughs> it uh, it pains me to see how much they're worth now because they they show on these ones. I'm like, I swear, I had three of those Charizards, <laughs> mate. I the reason I bring this up is I have one of the all time stories, and I'm not joking. Sometimes when you're in bed and you wake up in the middle of the night, and things still just like pop into your mind from like 15 <laughs> years ago. But I had a, like an incredible collection of of Pokemon cards. One being the Char- a Charizard, um, who's, you know, the pinnacle of the, the OG success. Mm. And back in the day, I'm sure you'd remember this, but um, you know, I didn't grow up in a, a wealthy family by no means, but you could buy cards and you'd go to like these places and you'd put them on lay-by. And there was a Charizard that I, we bought back, you know, when I would have been like probably six or seven years old for $50. And we used to go back there for five weeks, we'd put $10, like, you know, it was just something that we would, would do our mum would show me you know how it would work you'd like save up and put ten dollars a week <laughs> to like buy this charizard anyway got the charizard like out of the hundred pokemon i, I would have had like 70 cards like it was an, an impeccable collection now for people who don't care about pokemon they're gonna not give a fuck about this story but i'm telling it <laughs> anyway i took that and it was something that i was so you know like pedantic about it's like you know those kids when they didn't even want to pass their new footy i was like that with my pokemon cards like, i didn't even want to like bring them anywhere I brought them to school one day, put them in my fucking tub. And when you're in primary school, you're in a tub, you don't have locks, okay? Because you're primary school, you don't think kids are going to be thieves. You you, you trust (laughs) your fellow seven-year-olds to do the right thing. My fucking Pokemon card collection got stolen. And I look back today, I see Logan Paul selling these fucking Charizards (gasps) for like 50 grand. So the lesson is never assume the best of people. No, that's exactly what the story is. Um, If I just ask you on your Pokemon quickly, you (laughs) Your top three Pokemon of all time. Have you got any favourites? So Blastoise was was me number one. Same. Um, don't know what it was about him. Just like yeah. his, I don't know. Just like his look. He's, I loved his aura. Yeah, actually, um, actually found Pikachu quite annoying. Um, <laughs> love Gyarados. Yeah, nice. Great, uh, great evolution from the from a from a fish that does absolutely nothing. Yep. And um, I'm gonna go with my third Zapdos. Yeah, oh my god, the man, this is bird. This is actually quite scary. My top three was Blastoise, Zapdos, and Charizard. I can't go past the OG, which <laughs> obviously I used to have the card in about fifteen plastic pockets with no scratches on it whatsoever. Um, I thought we'll, you we'll would move have on put, from that. put Charizard down your list just because what happened. No, no, I'm still <laughs> still trying to hunt those down. But um, last thing was just on Pokemon quickly. I don't even know if this will make the final edit because it's I don't think it's relevant to anyone. But I used to play it a lot on um, Game Boy. And the amount of fucking Rattatars I used to catch walking through the green fields, <laughs> like that was the most annoying Pokemon of all time. There was that one in uh, Caterpie or, or one of those Pokemons or Pidgeys. Yeah, Pidgeys were just a fucking pests. Yeah, they, they were rodents. Um, <laughs> um, Got to get rid of them. Hey, mate, you've been unbelievable today. Um, cannot thank you enough for your time. You've been an absolute star. I'm so excited for what's next for, for Lin Jong. You've got some unbelievable knowledge experience lessons i suppose to be to handing over to, to young people so i really hope that whatever it is you get involved in in something where you can be mentoring people mate because you've um you've got an unbelievable story which we've heard today and i'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that that listen today and can benefit from it lastly we've touched on this earlier um but ideal job next year what what would it look like is it is it in that type of role of working with kids or in still in football would you like like w- rather work with young athletes or is it just in general like what what does it look like um i think um originally i, I really wanted to do uh that sort of um play development role um that sort of welfare role that um that you know all footy clubs have and um because that was you know a really sort of impactful thing for me um, um and so hopefully hopefully the uh the um, future, you know, something, there's a job down the track somewhere for me. I just feel like I have 
sort of a bit to offer in that space. Um, but if it wasn't for that, um, then I'd love to just work in the mental health field in, in whatever capacity, um, um, whether that's writing people's stories or, or, or being able to share mine or, or anything that, um, that can just help people in that field. You know, it sounds a bit corny and broad, but um, I'd love to work in the mental health field. Mate, you'll get there and you, you'll do an incredible job. And, and just on that, I saw I was watching your first game debut the other day and you were actually playing with Dylan Addison, who was the yeah, who was a yeah, welfare yeah, manager yeah. at the Giants, who is honestly one of the best in the field of all time. So um, if there's any similarities there, you should definitely get in touch with um, Shovel to, to chat about that because that man I'll is I'll see if star. he needs an assistant, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> get up to Sydney. Mate, thank you so much. Um, loved, loved the chat today. Can't thank you enough for your openness, honesty, and, and just join us on the show, man. I really appreciate it. No worries, mate. I'm, I'm happy to help. Hopefully it helps, uh, helps some people out there. Thank you.